All right, all right, all right. It is time for another episode of Dirt to Dust, coming to you from the Hurricane Studios here <laughs> in the heart of North Carolina. Uh, it is. definitely feels like that right now. I'm sure it is outside you too, outside here, man. It is. Uh, it's coming down this so little tropical storm or depress. I don't know what it is now that it's hit North Carolina, but um, man, it is dumping some rain. Debbie is Debbie is soaking Central North Carolina. Debbie today. is a Debbie Downer right now for Ooh, sure. Seriously, uh, I got pants no, I'm, on I'm, today, man. This is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I stepped out earlier with the dogs out, and it was it was actually considerably cooler than it has been. And, right. Uh, I'm getting notifications that like everywhere around my neighborhood is without power, but this is a brand new neighborhood with brand new. <laughs> with I brand just new got a call. So hopefully it works out. Like 15 minutes ago, I got a call from the shop in Greensboro and he's like, Hey man, is your internet working? I was like, yeah. He's like, well, we just had a flicker here. Now the internet's not working. I was like, well, you probably had a power surge or something like that. Yeah. But it's, it's going pretty good. I'm like, well, I hope we got enough internet to film a podcast episodes. <laughs> like, We're going to uh, try. <laughs> it's man, it is. It's coming down. In fact, we had the issue last week where yeah. uh, I apologize to the, uh, to the dirt to dust nation for leaving you alone with Caleb. Uh, but I was a victim of that um, weird thing where just like all spectrum internet died while we like at like we were what, like three minutes from the end of our episode so luckily we got oh if 95 yeah. percent of it in but they like 9 30 that night it finally came back on and it was a pretty wide area like i've got spectrum at home we got spectrum at the shop we got spectrum at the office it was pretty it was down for a long time so everybody was like you know it was lord of the flies everybody was freaking out but they came out with like some weird press release like the next day saying well you know we apologize for the service the outage it was a third party effect on an undisclosed blah blah blah, and I'm like, they're like, yeah, we're not going to release that for security purposes, and I'm like, yeah, okay, you got hacked. Sounds <laughs> like they got hacked. I was like, you got hacked, <laughs> but yeah, we were down for hours. Um, we basically there was people like posting on Facebook, local businesses saying, you know, oh, we're sorry, we're having to close early today. Hey, no internet, it just makes you. It kind of makes you understand how dependent the world is on technology. Yeah, which is like a really interesting segue because last week we talked about electrification, which is technology, and then we're going to continue that this week um, mm -hmm. with talking about different other types of technology. Um, yeah. We'll get into that. We do have. I did see the uh, the outline for the episode. We do have the mailbag is back. I know I gave you mail some crap for that last week. The mailbag <laughs> is back. Um, we got all that coming back. I don't know of any you know current events or anything that changing, but we'll get into all that kind of stuff. But uh, before that, let's uh, let's get right into the episode. Without further ado, let's get this going. When other people see dirt, you see glory. And when you see a vehicle for the first time, your first thought is not how pretty it is, but how much abuse can it take? <laughs> This is Dirt to Dust, presented by Outlaw Off-Road. If it's anything off-road and dirty, we probably like it, and we're probably talking about it. You'll get industry info, tech talk, and interviews with the biggest and best in the industry. Let's do it. This is Dirt to Dust. And now your hosts, Doug Langford and Caleb Forbes. Man, what a good voiceover guy we have. Let's do it. Oh. <laughs> Your first thought is not how pretty. I could I can't do it. Like no, I, I I'm I'm okay I could do it if I wanted the voice to for the trying. podcast, but he's awesome, man. He's yeah. he's done a bunch of stuff for us over the years too and like anytime, like when we when we came back and it was gonna be we added you as the co host, I just messaged him up. I was like, Hey man, I need you to do like that same cool crap you did last year, but just add Caleb Forbes to it. And he was yep. dude like thirty minutes later and it just sounds he's he's pretty awesome. He's pretty awesome. Yeah, I remember so. you sent it over pretty quickly. It was it was fast. It was pretty impressive. And it, he's like, dude, I don't even remember how it, he recreated that from scratch because he didn't have the file anymore. Mm -hmm. He's like, dude, I can't oh, wow. find the file. So I sent it over to him, and he's like, "Okay, I can do this." And like an hour later, it was done. <laughs> Man, this guy's good. Yeah, he's got a. Awesome. I don't know. Maybe he's got a face for radio. I don't know. But technologically speaking, let's talk about some. Uh, let's talk about some technology here. I know you had um, some tech things that you wanted to hit on 
today. So let's uh, mm-hmm. let's get into some tech talk. Yeah. So um, last week we talked about technology in vehicles and the electrification of vehicles and what Ciao. the future of off-road electric vehicles might look like. Um, this week, I kind of want to segue off of that because we branched off um, last week and finished talking about um, just technology and vehicles, live valve shocks, and you know, just the latest and greatest. And um, the question I had after that episode that kind of came to mind was, okay, with all of this technology in place, uh, does that technology replace um, off-road, like traditional off-road skills, um, a skill set? And the more I thought about it, the more I could put together some bullet points of pros and cons and yes and no's. And uh, I was like, hmm, this is going to be a good episode. And uh, yeah, so I shot it over to you. But uh, yeah, so I guess today we're going to talk about our traditional off-road skills outmatched by modern technology. Well, I don't have any traditional off-road skills. <laughs> so <laughs> I, Yeah, well, that's really, yeah, I don't have any. I, I ran out of talent the moment I was born as far as. Well, you see my uh, my name tag on, on today's I episode. Yep. Pretend I off-roader. Pretty, it's, it's, you know. I, yeah. <laughs> well, I call myself the world's most okayest racing driver. And that's, yeah, that's fairly accurate. That's, it that's is a pretty accurate description. Um, I think so. But having gone from, I've, I mean, I've had every single generation of the Wrangler. Um, so I've had manual transmission, four cylinder YJ. I've had a um, JL with everything that we could put in it, 40s and all the good stuff. And now I'm scaling back to an LJ um, with pretty much nothing. <laughs> Uh, I've got a double den radio so I can have CarPlay. That's the only technology that I want in the LJ. So, um, so my first thing is like, what types of technology do you see that could potentially replace some driver error or make up for lack of driving skill? Uh, so it's weird because, you know, when I started off road and I was in like a manual Ford Ranger with no AC vinyl seats, roll up windows, like it was, there was no technology, right? It mm-hmm. was nothing. And then now I've got the 4 by e Wrangler. So I feel I have literally run the gambit. But I'll tell you, I mean, yeah, the 4 by e did great in Moab, and, and someday I'll get it back from Dan at Next Venture. <laughs> so, <laughs> although I do have a supposedly, per a text message from Dan Ford at Next Venture Motorsports, I have a completion date, and it's she's coming, she's coming east. She's done. Nice. And she is going to be loaded up with all the great latest, latest and greatest Next Venture Motorsports goodies. So we'll talk about that later. Should be back here sometime. I think it's heading back sometime next week um, mm-hmm. to Nashville. I'm going to fly out to Nashville, pick it up, drive it to Windrock, and take it straight to trails. Um, so, but it's still there's a lot of freaking technology in that thing, and it is something to contend with. So, you know, you go from no tech, low tech, whatever to all this high tech and then you go to the racing space and it's like I want all the technology out of this vehicle. Mm-hmm. I want I want this, I want standalone. I want no, no I want no technology whatsoever. And the reason for that is not because we don't want the latest and greatest technology, but generally that stuff the more technologically advanced something is the less it's going to hold up to abuse. That's right. just you're not going to go drop your computer from your, you know, you're not going to go put your laptop in the uh, in the parking lot, go run over it and then expect it to work. Like, it's just not going to, that's not something that we, any of us expect. So I think there is some technology, but I like the technology that works off road is mechanical technology. Right. Um, you know, lockers, that's a mechanical technology, limited slip differentials. Eh, eh, it's still technology, still better than open. Um, Correct. that type of thing. I think the more mechanical you can make technology, the better you're going to make it off road, which is this weird dichotomy for manufacturers because, the more technology technology you make it, the more vehicles you're going to sell, right? Like the more Correct. times you put blind spot monitoring and electric rear view mirrors and adaptive cruise control and huge monitors and, you know, these big center console, you're going to sell more vehicles, right? I mean, mm-hmm. Dodge Ram started it in 18 or 19 with that giant 12 inch touchscreen. They sold a crap load of trucks. Yeah. So Ford was like, mm, okay, we're going to put a bigger one in there and we're going to do it. And then Chevy was like, mm, okay. And now it's, you know, it's the war of who can do the best info. Now they don't even call them head units or radios. They call them infotainment centers. Mm -hmm. Infotainment. Now we've got digital clusters, all this stuff. That stuff concerns me off-road. 
Yeah. It just does. So it's a weird, it's a weird thing. So I don't, I don't see quote unquote modern technology replacing just straight up experience and driving ability off road. Mm -hmm. I do think that driving ability and experience makes you better at wheeling with the technology. Case in point, four by E in Moab. When I started wheeling the four by E in Moab and I started experiencing these things I didn't like, um, I understood what they were and I was like, oh, okay, well let me let me try to figure this out and work this to my advantage. Fast forward a couple of days later and I'm like, okay, now I'm comfortable wheeling this thing. Um, but it still had its drawbacks. It's got this big battery pack, it's super heavy. Well, how do you make that an advantage? How do you turn that from a disadvantage to an advantage? I've got an electric, you know, an electric system. Okay, well, how do you turn that from a disadvantage to an advantage? You know, all those kind of things. But the technology is not I did that in spite of the technology, not because of the technology. I ended up having to drive mm-hmm. and then having to work with the technology instead of trying to work against it. So do I think it can replace driving skill? No. Can it be an aid? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I get that. Um, some of the things I kind of highlighted for my bullet points personally, um, and I agree with you here that it doesn't replace, but some of the things that can help, um, things such as, uh, multiple vehicle cameras, um, in vehicle incl- inclinometers and like one touch access to multiple gauges, temps, every, you know, drive train monitors. Like you have in the four by E you have your off road pages that shows you everything that's going on with that, including individual wheel speed, tire pressures. Um, even I would, I would even put in forties or bigger. Um, that's relatively a newish thing in the last, we'll call it 10 years that have become very popular that has made wheeling much, much easier. Um, and then you've got well, like the, uh, the Bronco has the goat mode. Uh, Toyota wow. has crawl control. Mm-hmm. I don't think Jeep has anything like that yet, but I'm sure something is probably yeah, coming. Plus would be the closest thing I could think of. Yeah, yeah correct. Yeah. Correct. Um, yeah. And that's where for low, you just basically you set the speed and you can trim up or down trim on the speed and let it go. Um, oh yeah. He'll yeah, so, yeah. They still got that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So some of those things um, I definitely feel like, for a, someone new into off-roading, I feel like that could be both a help and a hindrance. It definitely helps and definitely gets you off-road, get you a little more comfortable because the vehicle's working with you now. But at the same time, you're thinking about it less as you're doing those things. The problem is, though, I've had the JL since it came out. And I've had the off-road pages. I've had the inclinometer. I've had all the tire. I've had all that. And after the new wears off, you don't freaking use it. I, I'll i tell you what I use on my screen more than anything else. And this was, and this goes for the race car and the Stinger 10. This goes in the 8.4. All of it is the, is the, I will turn on the reverse camera. Hmm. Okay. And so that I can see people behind me. Cause generally when you're off, I've got, I might have stuff in the rearview mirror. I've got, you know, a top on or, you know, in the four by you, I've actually got the spare back there, but I will turn on a camera. If I had a front camera, I'd probably turn on the front camera. But I will turn on the rear camera because I've gotten used to looking back in there because I always wheel at every driver's meeting. I talk about the mirror rule. You should, when you're wheeling, make sure you see the person behind you in your mirror. Mm -hmm. If you can't see him, stop. Wait till you can see him. If it takes more than a minute or so, get on the radio. So because of that, I use the radio to kind of help me with mirror mode, you know, kind of mirror mode. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I mean, I've used the inclinometer not to help me drive, but just to see how much I could do. Like it's been a, it's been how yeah. much can I push this? And I'll just make a mental mm-hmm. note like, dude, I got this to 37 degrees. Um, but as far as helping me wheel, I think once that new wore off, it's just more, I think it was more for me to look at and more for me to do. However, if I'm a new wheeler, I could see using that in a totally different way mm-hmm. to start learning the limits of the vehicle so that maybe in a year or so now I don't need that stuff because now I'm doing it by, you know, my rear end sensor versus looking at the screen. So I could see that mm-hmm. helping somebody new, but still it doesn't, you know, cause once you get the skill, like you said, you know, you asked the question, can it replace driving ability? No. Could it help you get better driving ability where you don't need it anymore? Yes. So I'll, 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 I'll put that in there with the aid. But I do like cameras. Cameras are pretty sweet. My truck's got a ton of cameras. I think the 4 by has got one. But I think everybody now has to have a backup camera. I think that was federal law after 
Yeah, 20, 2018. It was. Yeah, 2018. 2018. Uh, like September of 2018. Yeah, I think that was it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff. Definitely a lot of cool stuff. Um, I think the front camera off-roading is pretty sick. I think that's pretty helpful for anybody because that's the one complaint. Like, I don't care if you're in a Bronco or a Ringo or whatever. You can't see what's in front of your tires. Like, unless yeah. you go fenderless and, you know, now you're in a safety. Like, am I going to lean out the car the whole time? Um, sorry, race car. We really got the Jeep uh, or the Bronco or the Toyota to lean out and drive like that so I can see what's in front of the tires. But then again, it's fenders, which is especially the case on overland vehicles, Bronco, stuff like that. Jeep, you can mitigate it a little bit, but you still can't see right in front of it. And a, a trail cam is that. So I love the yeah. idea of cameras. Cameras are pretty awesome. I know some of them even have like, um, with some of the setups and even aftermarket, you can get like underbody, underbody cameras too um, and really get really get fun with it. So I know mm-hmm. I was looking at, um, I think the Hummer EV has that and all that. So there's a bunch of them that have it. So I think cameras are cool. The other stuff I just think is, I don't know, window dressing or maybe something to help you get better. But then I think eventually the goal is you just don't need it anymore. Yeah, no, I think I agree with you there. Um, that definitely is the ultimate goal is to not need those things anymore. But, uh, and just throwing it out here, I'm not anti-technology. <laughs> I've, uh, I see the benefit of having those things on a vehicle and not, um, personally for the LJ, it wasn't designed to have all this stuff on it. Right. Uh, I am installing a backup camera for the same reason why you said I like to check behind me. Um, if my head unit has the functionality to add a second camera, I think a front camera would be pretty cool. Uh, yeah. But Agreed. for me, um, I'm already kind of cheat coding it here with a stretched wheelbase LJ on 42s <laughs> with the super with, low Hey, gear. that is technology, Caleb. That is a form. When we talk about mechanical yeah. technology, that is yeah. mechanical technology. And that's the stuff like if you can give me technology that if it fails, it I'm still driving. Okay. Mm-hmm. Like you give me a bunch of cams and they go out. Like the, let's say the module goes out and I can't have cams. Well, I can still yeah. wheel. Absolutely. I can still do that. But you put me in something like an electric drive system or an electric, you know, something, you know, we were talking about it last week with the drive by wire system for off roading. If that was installed on a vehicle and a new person goes out and the drive by wire off road system fails, they're going to like You're probably done. break something. Be like, what am I going to do? Like, you got somebody who doesn't know what the heck they're doing. That's going to mm-hmm. be a problem. So I love mechanical technology. The problem with mechanical technology is mechanical technology breaks, you're broken generally if technology technology breaks you're still mechanically going to go so it's a weird it's a weird i don't know it's a weird fence to be on i think there's i love technology to a limit we'll put it to that (laughs) to a limit well that kind of leads me into my next segment of i don't want to call it low tech or or old tech because the technology that we have now has allowed manufacturers to produce some really, really, really awesome things. Case in point, the LJ with rock crawler, uh, rock crawler has now been able to develop uh, high clearance control arms and almost mimic the JL geometry on an LJ, something that's mm-hmm. 20 years old um, to produce what, and I'm, I'm can't not wait to try this out, but what could be probably one of the best suspensions for a TJ LJ period a completely flat belly there's some things we had to work around but without that technology moving us forward um i wouldn't we wouldn't have that we would still be on old four link calculators and pirate four by four but some other we'll call it mechanical technology because i really like that term i don't like old tech or low tech um but some of those things that i wanted to include would be lockers a low range transfer case uh, good spotting skills mechanical knowledge winch and recovery equipment and if we're, we'll go back to a really, 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 really old tech of just good old rock stacking. <laughs> the, the, the original, uh, to get the you, original to get technology. You, the original technology to get you off off the trail. Uh, so where do you see mechanical technology as far as trumping modern technology? I mean, I think overall, that's the base that you have to have. Mm-hmm. Like you have to have that basic level of technology if you're going to go and seriously if you're going to go and seriously off-road now there's a lot of technology that is not designed for off-roading at all even though it may be in an off-road vehicle but that is designed for marketing and that is designed mm-hmm. to reach a wider base to increase your customer base i.e jeep wranglers with adaptive cruise control 
Mm-hmm. Like adaptive cruise control was not built to go to your local trail and go rock climbing. It wasn't. It was built to be more comfortable on the interstate or on a commute or whatever and appeal that vehicle to a wider base to sell more vehicles because the more vehicles you sell, obviously you're going to have more money and you can do now you can do more cool things to research because, you know, people people on Facebook groups and Instagram and whatever like to trash on, you know, noobs and people who don't really know anything. And I mean, I see some of these questions on Facebook groups. I'm like, you're not even an adult. Like it's it's pretty crazy. But without people like that buying the product, buying the Jeep, buying the stuff that they have no clue what they're talking about, they're still paying money. And that money mm-hmm. now allows, you know, does every person who buys a rock crawler suspension go out on off-road? No, the vast majority don't. But they buy it for one reason or another. It was recommended to them. Um, they liked it better. That was what the shop sold. Uh, they like yellow. I don't know. Like, you know, maybe they, <laughs> which is pretty often the case, they make a post on Facebook and Jeremy Purick's pretty active on, on a lot of the social media boards and he mm-hmm. makes a comment to him. You know, some of these owners are very active on social media. Um, Jeremy Purick from Rockcrawler comes to mind. Uh, Dave Schlossberg from Synergy comes mm-hmm. to mind. Mel at, Mel at Evo used to be, but there's a lot of these guys. Some of these are Rusty at Rusty's off road used to be, but Jeremy and Dave are the two ones that I think of the most. I know Justin's pretty active from JKS, even though he, no, he doesn't mm-hmm. own Fox JKS, but he has like the marketing brand guy. Um, he's pretty active online. So when these guys come online, that can be a selling point. Oh, this guy yeah. like, works for the company and he's a higher up. And he's a, so, whatever reason you buy it for, they're not using it, but. They sell enough of those kits. That's income. That's revenue. They don't. If they only relied on people who are actually going to use their product to the edge of its capability, they wouldn't sell enough product to R and D anything else. Just like with your kit, technology was used to develop it, but it was more of Jeremy getting out there and seeing what worked and didn't work, getting out there mm-hmm. and wheeling and saying, "Hmm, this would be nice. Hmm, we need to do that." And then his brain figured out how to use technology to develop the system that he wanted. But it came from just his brain first, and Mm -hmm. then it went to using the technology. So, again, we go back to using technology as an aid. Um, You know, there's just different kind. You know, you talk about mechanical technology and then, like, basically, you know, modern technology or computer technology. You know, that's the difference. Um, But I think the more more mechanical it gets, the more of a fan I am of it Mm -hmm. in general. Now, not all of it, no, but, you know, lockers are mechanical technology. I'm a huge fan of lockers. But how are you going to engage them? They're either electric or air. You're either yep. getting a switch. That's technology, right? You're not there. It, I, and I get there's one or two companies out there you can like manually engage a locker. I totally get yeah, that. Cable lockers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cable lockers and all that. And that, but that is a case where, okay, let's let's compromise a little bit. I'm not a fan of a mm-hmm. cable locker. Okay, that's I'm not a caveman. It's one right. more hole you have to drill through the tub. Right. One more line you have to run. But do I see the benefit of it? Do I see the draw of it? Yeah, it's a very small part of the market. I'm an e-locker guy. There's guys mm-hmm. with 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 air lockers, but if you got air lockers, you got to have a compressor. You got to switch it up. You got to mm-hmm. put it on a switch. You got to have compa- yeah, more You got to still use some piece of computer technology for mm-hmm. most of these manual technology things. Other than maybe I don't know sway bar disconnects. You know manual sway bar disconnects. You know if you don't have a Rubicon, you know you can go and buy um, some Terraflex disconnects or rock crawler disconnects or synergy or Evo or Me- metal cloak or whatever. And you're actually getting out there and manually disconnecting. You're manually airing down a tire. Mm-hmm. You know, that's as manual as it gets. Um, but now but we're getting else, into manual technology that mm-hmm. is new technology as well. So it's like case in point. Um, I've got, uh, grizzly lockers, Yukon grizzly lockers in the LJ. I don't have to turn a switch or do anything when they, when the tire slips, it grabs. Mm-hmm. Um, on top of that, there is, um, Curry anti-rock sway bars front and rear. So that's a relatively new technology, but that's pretty simply mechanically advantage. Um, so, so yeah, we're now you're getting into things that are newer technology, but still mechanical, which I think is the best of both worlds. Um, I know like you, you really like e-lockers and for the most part, I really like e-lockers as well. Um, I don't like air lockers just cause there's more points of failure there. I've seen O-rings blow out and all of a sudden you don't have lockers anymore. Um, but at the same time, I've also seen, um, a locker switch ground out and now you don't have lockers anymore. And yep. that, that was yep. a common thing on factory JKs. They would ground themselves out. Um, so I went with 
more mechanical on that just to eliminate the need for that. And, but I also saw a ton of ultra four racers who are using grizzly lockers and you don't have to think about it or worry about it. I'm, I'm Detroit front and rear on the race car mm-hmm. and Curry, any rock front and rear. <laughs> uh, and we had that discussion. Curry and I had yeah. that discussion when we were building the axles. They're like, well, we want to, you know, what kind of axle are you going to put in there? And they were, they were really wanting me to go e locker. Mm-hmm. And I said unequivocally, no. Uh, if this was my wheel and rig, unequivocally, yes. I mean, obviously, mm-hmm. my four by e is a Rubicon. I have electric lockers front and rear. But in a race car, in a race situation, absolutely not. Um, and the reasoning was, I mean, you're beating, and I, and I cannot explain this to someone who's not been in a race car. You are absolutely beating the living crap out of everything that is in that car. There is so much movement, so much vibration, so much impact force vertically, horizontally. It's all over the place. And I don't mm-hmm. trust electrical connection. I don't trust it in those circumstances. There's dirt, there's water, there's mud, there's rocks, there's whatever. I need to be able to go through and over anything I need to go through and over mm-hmm. in order to place or win a race. Like, okay, you've got to. So we had that conversation. I was like, look, I mean, it was a deal breaker. Like, if they would have made me go e locker, I wouldn't have run the axle. Like it was mm-hmm. that it's that important to me. So um, on that one, it's auto locker. Now in its previous iteration, it was a spool in the rear. Now for those who don't know what a spool is, it's just always locked. There is no mechanical mm-hmm. thing back there. It is just a solid carrier. It is always the front. The you know the left and right are always moving at the same speed. There there is no um, there is no allowance made for the right rear and the left rear to move at different speed. It is it is locked up all the time. But there is no gear in there to actually keep it locked. It is just a solid. You think about it when you when you call it a spool. You think about the old uh, wire spool that you know Jeff Foxworthy made fun of and joked about using a spool for a coffee table back in the you might be a redneck days. It's kind of like that, right? It's just a solid. Mm-hmm. Everything solid. It's very 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 strong. It's very very difficult to break. So that's why people like it in race conditions. But you never want to put that on pavement. You just don't no. want to do that. You don't want to. I don't even want to like drive it and park it in a booth at a show like, i don't even want to mm-hmm. do that auto lockers though when they turn as soon as they turn they can unlock but if they start slipping or they're in a straight line in a straight line they're automatically locked and then if one starts slipping you can automatically lock them and different brands handle that different ways but the race car has auto lockers in it no switches no electrical no airlines no none of that that is old technology but again I use that because of the abuse that it is being subjected to. The less mm-hmm. abuse you subject a vehicle to, the more modern technology I think you can use and Ooh, you should that's, use. That's that's a cool thing to save right there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't have air conditioning yeah. in the race car. I got it in the 4xe. I don't Absolutely. have a radio. I don't have speakers and a cool radio in the race car. I got an upgraded audio system in the 4xe. It makes things nicer. It makes things mm-hmm. more comfortable, and I enjoy it more. And if you enjoy it more... You're going to do it more. If every mm-hmm. time you go out and off-road, it kind of sucks and you're having to deal with the elements. If, if you want more people to off-road, you have to make it more accessible. You know, it's yeah. like the it's like the argument between regular mountain bikes and e-mountain bikes, and I'm not going to get into that. But <laughs> if you can make it more enjoyable and easier to access to the general public, you're going to bring more people to that thing, that sport, that yeah. hobby, that whatever, and it's no different in off-roading. No, I agree 100%, which... Yeah, I mean, I, I agree hundred percent, and and I think it's all situational. Like you, like you hit the nail on the head right there. Um, the more abuse you're putting your vehicle subject to, the less technology you need, and the less abuse you're subjecting it to, the more technology you can afford to put in there. I yep. think that is the best way to put it in there. Um, but going back to the original point, I don't think technology replaces driver skill. As you said, I agree. I think it just aids in driver skill, and it should. Um, but that. Leads me to my third segment. <laughs> we got um, segments, people. For for those who are using their vehicles and dailying those vehicles, um, I see a lot of pressure, especially on social media, um, and for one reason or another, that'll be an episode for another day, to upgrade and have the latest and greatest upgrades and continue upgrading, continue spending money on it, or the pushback on that is, no, it works great as is. I'm leaving it as is. Um, do you have any reasons, we'll call it a couple of reasons to upgrade and a couple of reasons not to upgrade? I mean, my reasons to upgrade and not upgrade would be the same. It, it should be based on one of two things. And it's the same thing I say for people wanting reservoir shocks. 
Do you need reservoir shocks? 90% of people don't. However, if you want them and can afford them and you want to pay for badass factor, go for it. So there is a small percentage of the market that needs that. There is. But by and large, the most people that are buying it, which are the people that are paying the bills to keep these companies afloat, because I'm telling you, hardcore off-roaders don't spend enough money to keep these companies afloat. It, it's it's right. not that, that. This market ain't funded that way, people. Uh, it is funded by the duck crowd. Hate mm -hmm. me, love me, whatever. It Off-road industry is funded by beginners and intermediates. It ain't funded by the hardcore act, by the hardcore enthusiast. It's just not. Uh, it never has been, never will be, and the market has figured that out in the last 10 years, and they are making money as a result, which is why prior to five, six, seven years ago, you never saw investment groups buying off-road companies. Right. Now investment groups own off-road companies. A lot of them. Because they can <laughs> corporatize it. That's just what it is. Right. Um, so I think the reasons to upgrade, um, either you need it, you're, you're, you're progressing in your wheeling, where you are needing stuff you want you you're, you're you're running 40s and you need to upgrade certain things to run the 40s you're going off-roading every single weekend and you're getting progressively harder and harder and harder so you need upgrades to match what you're doing with the vehicle that would be need based mm -hmm. um and and what you need based on that is is different but need based upgrades the other mm -hmm. reason to upgrade is if you just freaking want it like mm -hmm. if you just want your jeep a certain way and it's upgrades that you might never use. Like, let's be real. There's plenty of people out there on 40s that will never put in a four-wheel low. Their upgrades are going to be it's different. True. They're not They're not going to do upgrades based off need because a JL will run 40s on the pavement without a ton of upgrades. You could probably mm -hmm. gear it, and you're probably going to be okay for a very long time. Do you run the risk of causing some damage? Yeah, you do. You know, if you're trying to take off hard from, you know, stoplights and whatever, yeah, there's a risk. But if you're driving it like a normal human being, the risk is very low. Whereas mm -hmm. if you take that same vehicle and now you put it in four-wheel low and go off-road, now we're going to have a needs-based list. It's not a wants-based list anymore. So I think if you need it, then you kind of have to do it, right? If you need it, you're going to do it or something's going to break. If you want it, it's just a matter of what do you want and can you afford it? And if the answer is, yeah, I want it and yeah, I can afford it, then it's not needs based at all. It's just wants based. Now, the reason not to upgrade, same. <laughs> if you don't need it, you don't need to upgrade. Mm -hmm. If you don't, also, if you don't need it and you don't want it, then you don't upgrade. Like different people want different things. Like I have a full built race car and then I have a very regular built four by E. Um, and then I have other vehicles that aren't built. You know, my ZR2 is not built right it's not it's not stupid built um but that's my daily driver truck it's a tow rig so i'm gonna build right. it differently based on my needs and wants so if you need it and want it upgrade it and or want it and can afford it i mean that's that's basically what it is at the end of the day because somebody's you know i see all this all the time what's not going to break the bank i don't know what's in your bank account <laughs> one man's ten one man's ten thousand right. is another man's one thousand like it just it's right. all relative one guy looks at his bank account and sees twenty thousand dollars in there and goes, "Ooh, man, my bank account's getting a little bit low." The other guy looks at twenty thousand, looks at the same amount in his bank account, and goes, "I'm rich." I mean, it's just all a matter <laughs> of perspective, right? And I don't, I don't care either way. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the reason, the reasons are the same. The results just different. Um, you know, I and I say that being a guy that buys stuff and then immediately upgrades it because I don't. You know, I bought a mountain bike. I didn't need to do some of the stuff I did. I bought a, you know, I, it probably would have done 85% of what I wanted it to do. Mm -hmm. This is not what I am. I wanted to mm -hmm. do it and I could afford it. So I stripped it down to the frame and we built it completely back up. That was, that was, that was a hybrid of need and want, but mostly want. And I could admit mm -hmm. that. And it would be the same reason why I bought another bike that has a totally different purpose. And I'm not doing as much to it because I don't need it. And I don't want to spend the money. I just don't see the point. So, you know, I've got a little piddle around bike. It's got no rear shock. It's just a nice little hardtail. It's a Trek Roscoe 7. You can Google it mm -hmm. and see what it is. Um, I, I ride that around campgrounds. I ride that on gravel stuff, you know, whatever. And then I've got this Fuel EXE that's stupid built. Um, and they're two totally different, you know, quote unquote vehicles. But they also do two totally different things. Right. Yeah. Needs and wants based. So I think the reason to upgrade, need it and or want it, 
The reason not to upgrade, you don't need it or you don't want it. Yeah. Two sides of the same coin. Yeah. I think my reasons would be a little bit different. Um, reasons to upgrade if you've if you've used your vehicle to the point where it's not enjoyable anymore and you want to take on more hard stuff that you can't do that without, again, it's a need. It becomes a need uh, a to need. upgrade. Yeah. Um, say you're on 37s, you've wheeled on 37s for the longest time, you've resisted the urge to go to 40s and do crazy things on, we'll call it you know, JL or JK44s. You've played it safe. You've ran all the trails you've possibly wanted to run, but now you want to run School Bus, or now you want to run Pritchett Canyon. Um, at that point, yeah, um, definitely make those upgrades and go to 40s and, and progress your skill, progress your, your knowledge, progress the enjoyment of the sport. Um, if you've got a JK, I'm just going to go ahead and say you probably need to upgrade it anyways, <laughs> unless it's a fully built JK. <laughs> yeah. Um, but at the same time, um, what bothers me more than anything is people upgrading solely based off of pressure and peer pressure from social media. I've said this on a previous podcast when I got on my little soapbox here. Um, but do not upgrade just because everyone in your Jeep club has, has, is running 40s like I have, here's a soapbox for you, you know, <laughs> stand, just stand right there stand right there just stand right um there. doing things based purely on social media uh and coming from the guy who works on social media every single day uh it's just one of those things that grinds my gears and just doing things for the sake of presenting themselves as better on social media especially when you get them off road or you get them on a trail and they can't do anything I mean, have zero knowledge internet, otherwise. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, so that's my big reason for not upgrading is just solely based on, on social media. I would say another reason not to upgrade is if you're truly happy with what you've got, you're running the trails and you don't, there's, there's no need. You don't want to take your vehicle through something that could potentially get you body damage. Um, or you're just, again, super happy with what you've got and where it is. Like there's no really need to upgrade other than creature comforts, um, which everyone loves to upgrade creature comforts. So, um, whether that's heated seats, heated steering wheel, better stereo system, what have you, um, again, like you said before, depending on how much abuse you're subjecting that to, um, yeah, I mean, those upgrades are phenomenal, but just to jump and go straight to forties, 42s, 43s one tons without ever wheeling it on the stock factor. I'm like, eh, you know, <laughs> maybe you should See, that's where we're different. slow down you, a little bit. You are definitely a needs-based guy. You are 100% definitely a needs-based form- You are definitely a function guy, and I am more of a, yes, I need it, but I uh, I, I want it to be this. So I <laughs> overboard it because of it being yeah. want. I, I mm-hmm. want that. Um, and you are like, Mm-mm, you're the more responsible adult on this, on this crew, that's for damn sure. I, I wait until the needs – mandate a want yeah and i um, never i've never done that <laughs> i've never been guilty of that ever not, yeah. not one time if you could see about 15 feet that way that mountain bike would tell you i'm an idiot and it's all wants based but again it's not that i didn't do it i didn't do it like you said i didn't do it because somebody on social media told me i needed to make my mountain bike look cooler um, right i did it because i bought it i knew what i wanted to do with it um and I said, okay, well, if I'm going to do it, I want to do it the way I want to do it. And I definitely subscribed to the buy once, you know, buy once, cry once. And when I decided I was going to do it, I went down the rabbit hole and I literally did everything. Now, did I need to do that? Absolutely not. Mm-hmm. Did I want to do that? Absolutely yes. It was yeah. not needs based. It was t- 15% need, 85% want, where I think for you, mm-hmm. you're more of an 85% need, 15% mm-hmm. want. You're definitely, like I said, you're a more responsible adult than I am. You're the well. I, I was in the want team. category with the JL, um, and this is where I learned my lesson big time. I bought the JL. And- uh oh, I think the hurricane has struck Caleb. We were worried this was going to happen. Do do do. Should we do a countdown? We should do a countdown. Oh, well, so we're going to count down. So I know what he was going to say. He was going to talk about that JL that he built up, put it on 40s, never swapped the axles, and he did do a bunch of stuff. But the tires were weird just because I think that was actually a uh, – it was a mistake. 
And I did just get a message from Caleb says, power flickered. I'll come back on in a second. So we'll have him back. Um, so, yeah, I think that's what I said is definitely true. I mean, yeah, the JL he had was a little bit different, but he doesn't have that anymore. So the LJ is definitely more uh, need-based, as I've seen, than uh, than want-based. So um, we'll try to get him back on here. But luckily, luckily, uh, we were getting close to the mailbag, and he did. Whew, thank you, Caleb. He sent me, pre-sent me the, uh, the mailbag questions so that I can get into them if, we, uh, if he doesn't get back here. The, the last part of that segment was going to be uh, just reasons to enjoy what you have. But I think we've kind of covered that in that if you're doing what you want to do, however that wheel, whatever that is, you're, you're a green trail whaler, you're a wheeler, you're a blue and black, you're, a, you're just a Jeep show and shine kind of person, whatever, um, you can, there's really no reason, not a need-based reason to upgrade beyond that. Unless, again, unless you just want to, you can afford it. Um, it's something you want to do. I'm certainly on that team with you if you want to do that. But I think that would be the reason to enjoy what you have is that you've got something that will do what you need it to do for whatever you do. You're a weekend warrior. You're a hardcore rock crawler. You're a racer. You're whatever um, that you're able uh, to do that. So I think that would be the reasons to enjoy what you have. And then the reasons to upgrade would just be, you know, do you need it or and or, and, and or I guess. Do you just want it? So I think we'll leave the upgrades right there. That's how we'll end our segments about technology, uh, which means that um, our little two-episode stretch of technology uh, is going to come to an end. I'm sure we'll talk about technology again at some point, but um, let me move on now. We're going to move on to the mailbag questions. We're going to get those pulled up so that I can see what I'm supposed to be answering. I'm really not taking a look at these um, very much other than I knew they were there and they were from our favorite things called the Facebook group. So we've got three of them today. So let's get into the Dirt to Dust mailbag. Question number one on the Dirt to Dust mailbag comes from Jamie. In the Wrangler JL group, I think this is the big one, the Jeep Wrangler JL group. It's a freaking massive group. Just had my lift and new shocks installed along with an alignment. Okay. What in the world would make this thing so hard to drive? Like, I feel like I'm fighting to keep it straight and it's just all over the road. Steering stabilizer, adjustable track bar, lift is a Terraflex 1.5 spacer with Falcon shocks. Okay. So I'm familiar with that lift, and there's not a lot of parts in that lift, and it goes back to what we've talked about numerous times with having a quote-unquote complete lift. Um, that kit has no caster correction. Um, so, Jamie, you need some caster correction here. You need some front control arms. You need what you're feeling more than likely is your light on caster. You want to be between five and six. You're probably four-ish. That is going to make that Jeep feel very, very good kind of flighty is what we're going to say. Um, it will make it feel like it's all over the road. Uh, it'll just make it feel like you're driving a sailboat and the wind changes direction every two seconds. That is more than likely caster. Easiest way to fix that is to grab you a set of either adjustable or already lengthened control arms. Uh, control arms, center of bolt, the center of bolt on a JL is 24 inches, I believe. And at your lift height, we'd want that probably 24 and a quarter to 24 and 5 sixteenths. That's for this is JLJT. That's not JK. It's a little bit shorter on the JK. Um, and you don't think that that quarter to five sixteenths of an inch makes a difference? It makes a massive difference. Like over a degree and a half to two degrees of caster you can easily do that. If you have fixed arms that are at that fixed 24, 24 inch length, um, you can't change that. You can't add caster. You can't subtract caster. You can't change that and mess with it. So you're kind of stuck with what you got, both caster and cross caster. So my answer to you would be control arms, control arms, control arms. Either Terraflex makes um, some. They're the uh, sport control arms. Are they least expensive? More of an OE-style bushing. Um, they are going to be cheaper than like a rock crawler, an Evo, something like that. They're fixed length. You, can't, you cannot adjust them. Um, but they are less expensive. If you want to upgrade from there, you can go to like the Rock Crawler Adventure Series. And then, of course, you can go up from there with the Evo, with the Johnny Joints, the Rock Crawler, the Metal Cloak, all that kind of stuff. So, But that's what you need. You need more caster. And without doing that, um, even Geo Brackets, I'm not a big Geo Bracket fan, but that is one thing because somebody's going to say, you could do Geo Brackets. Um, control Arms would be my recommendation there. So there you go, Jamie from Jeep Wrangler JL. 
Second question comes from Robert in the Jeep Gladiators Only group. By the way, officially the group on Facebook with the highest amount of fake accounts. I'm just going to go ahead and say that. They are freaking everywhere in there. Uh, and the highest amount of those used part groups that are the scammers for buying parts and selling parts, that group is terrible for it. Uh, I don't know who the admins are, but geez. Um, so second question, <clears throat> Robert from Gladiators Only. I'm looking at buying a new Gladiator and narrowed it down to a Rubicon or a Mojave. Okay. What's the difference and which is better? Ho, ho, ho. Well, 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 Mr. Robert. Um, I mean, from a drivability standpoint, there is really no difference. Um, the big thing is the Rubicon has a front locker. The Mojave does not. That's your. That's that's the biggest difference. Um, there are some brackets you're different, some other little stuff, but as far as like the marquee difference, um, it is that front locker. Um, I had a Gladiator that was a Mojave. Um, I loved it. I didn't really wheel it uh, very much, so it wasn't like it wasn't a thing uh, where I needed the front locker. But I do know I, I do know a lot of guys that wheel their Gladiator to the point where they do want a front locker. So that's the main thing. Now, as far as which is better, mm, I'll I'll, de I'll decline to answer because I don't know how you're going to use it. But if you need a front locker, I mean that's kind of the delineation right there. If you are going to drive it and use it in a style where you need a front locker, buy the Rubicon. Period. End of story. If you are not, then you can go with the Mojave. They both come a little bit lifted over. Sports and Overlands, they're already going to have a little bit of lift. Uh, they're already going to have that little bit bigger of a tire. They're already going to have that little bit higher of the cowl on the front. They're, they're going to they're gonna be very, very similar in a lot of ways. The Mojave was designed for desert. You don't generally, when you're ripping through the desert, that's why most trophy trucks are two-wheel drive. Uh, when you're ripping through the desert, you don't necessarily need four-wheel drive. Speed is your friend. But a Rubicon was made for the Rubicon Trail. Look at the names. The Rubicon was named for the Rubicon Trail. It's slow, it's rocks, it's methodical, it's lockers, it's all that. Mojave, we're ripping through the desert at 70, 80, 90, 100 miles an hour. We don't really need a front locker. In fact, we're only using the rear locker to make sure that the rears are spinning at the same time because we're going through sand. So that would be my that would be my kind of deciding factor there, I guess is what we'll say. Uh, if you need a front locker, go Rubicon. If you don't, you can go Mojave. If you don't care either way, get whatever gives you the best deal and you can get the best markdown um get the best markdown from jeep um that would probably be what i would say so um that's how we'll do that question mr robert from gladiators only and then the final question and it looks like caleb's trying to come back up here so we might actually get him back on to help close up this show uh is Corey from wrangler 2.0 owners actually not a terrible group we actually get some good content from this group Pretty decent group. Maybe the four-cylinder people are nicer. I don't really know. Uh, it's time to change the gear oil in the axles. What gear oil are you guys using? Is it better to run full synthetic? Okay, I just had this conversation with a customer yesterday, literally about this time yesterday, and he was trying to tell me uh, that he needed synthetic. And normally you would think, I'm a shop owner. I'm trying to sell as much as I can. I want to sell the synthetic, sell the synthetic, right? You get a higher ticket, all that kind of stuff. I actually disagreed with him. And, and here's why. So first of all, we need to know the delineation and what's the difference between conventional and synthetic oil. Synthetic oil is, if you, if you look under a microscope at oil and you look and you get down to the, the molecular level, s molecules of oil, you know, a perfect molecule of oil would be a perfect circle. Look at this little cat. That's a perfect molecule of oil right there. Unfortunately, it's natural. It's it's not all going to be like that. They're they're very. They've got little nicks in it. They got little divots. They've got corners. They've got rounded edges. They got all that stuff. It's not a perfect circle. Synthetic oil is basically finding the most perfect molecule of oil that you can find and replicating it billions and billions and billions and millions and millions of times. We have synthetic oil. It's still oil. We're just synthetically replicating the most perfect oil molecule that we could find. Now, there's differences in added pack, and ag there's all of that. But at its basic core. That's the molecular, that's the chemical, the chemistry difference in it. Generally speaking, a perfect molecule of oil is smaller. So we have small spaces in engines. We have small spaces to get oil in in differentials. Very, very small. When you're looking at backlash settings, which is the difference between a pinion and a, uh, a ring gear and a JL. Uh, what we shoot for is 0.005. That's 0 0.005 inches, people. You ain't that. They, we're talking human hairs here, man. Um, we're not even talking millimeters. We're talking, we're talking fractions of millimeters here. 
So we want to get as much oil in there as possible. So that would actually be an argument for synthetic. That being said, molecules are microscopic. So conventional is going to get in there and lubricate fine. Is synthetic going to lubricate better? Yes, the, the argument could be made that it would lubricate better. However, the temperature, which is where synthetic really shines, is not going to get high enough in a gearbox, differential, transfer case, that it does in an engine where synthetic really shines. Synthetic is really, really, really um, the, the way to go, I think, um, in an engine because of temperatures for, for nothing else. And there's a lot more things to lubricate. The main thing we're lubricating in a differential is that mating surface between uh, – there's, there's a lot of things to lubricate. But the main thing we're looking at is that mating surface from the pinion to the ring gear. Um, when we're changing that power from this way to this way. So we want to lubricate that. And there's not a lot of space in there to do it, but conventional oil will get in there. Generally speaking, I use conventional oil in most things. Uh, my recommendation would be, if you're in a race car, however, use synthetic. <laughs> I do use synthetic in the race car, yes, um, because it is auto-locked. It is locked a lot of the time. Heat generally does get a lot more. I'm putting a lot more power to it. Power leads to heat. Um, anytime the hotter something is, the more likely I am going to be to recommend synthetic. That being said, to Corey, if it if you're just if you're already time to change your oil, you probably got some miles on it, which means you probably drive it. I don't know how much of a wheeler you are. If you're a high speed wheeler, look at synthetic. If you're a low speed wheeler, or you're a weekend warrior, or you're just driving around, the weight that that calls for, which is a seventy five hundred eighty uh, W ninety. Um, is not going to be to the point that you are going to need synthetic. Now, if you have synthetic, that's not bad. You are going to be able to lubricate better. It is going to last longer because the breakdown is going to be less, especially in those temperatures, and you can go longer. So you know, synthetic does cost more, but it goes longer. Conventional costs less, but it goes less. So you're going to end up really spending about the same amount of money long term, Um so financially, it's pay me now or pay me later. Pay me more now and I give you a longer life. Or pay me less now and I'll see you back sooner. I mean, basically, that's the deal. Um, so from a wear standpoint, if you're going to keep this vehicle for a long time, I could see using synthetic. So in that case, I could see synthetic, but it's just, are you going to put it in a high heat environment? Or are you going to be keeping the vehicle for a very, very long time where the long-term wear and tear of the parts matters to you? Sure, you can go synthetic. I mean, I'm not going to. You know, this isn't one of those life or death things. It's kind of what you want to do. It kind of goes back to what we were talking about, the upgrades. It's a need and a want. I doubt you're going to have the need to go synthetic. However, you may have the want. And you can, and you may see some benefit and willing to pay for those benefits when you look at the synthetic. Not that I'm not a fan of synthetic. I am. I run synthetic oil in all my vehicles. My diesel, 4xE, the race car gets synthetic oil. Um, for me, it's mostly Amsoil. I'm an Amsoil guy. Um, but that's not saying that mobile's not fine, Castrol's not fine, Pennzoil Platinum. They're all good. All your top tier Havilland, all that, all your top tier oils are going to be completely and totally sufficient for what you're needing to do. Um, but as far as need, you know, you need to change the gear oil. <laughs> you need to put new gear oil in that differential. You don't need to put synthetic in there. Um, now, if you're only asking that question to justify buying synthetic, let me help you. Yeah, man, go ahead and buy that synthetic. You should do that. You should absolutely do it. Let me let me give you your confirmation bias, Senior Corey from Wrangler 2.0 owners. Um, but no, just like we've been talking about this episode, do you need it? No, but if you want it, it's definitely you're not going to hurt your vehicle either way. Um, it's more important that you just change it. Now, obviously, we got the miles on it. You need to change it. So, change your gear oil. Use a quality oil. Don't use that sawdust, you know, store brand stuff. Get a good quality gear oil. Because while I understand the base oil is mostly the same, the additives package is where the difference is in all these oils. Um, and everybody's additive package is, is different to a degree. Um, but I'm more of a top-tier guy. I don't like using cheap gas because of the additive packages. And I don't like using cheap oil for the same, for the same reason. So that is how we are going to end the mailbag. And it does look like Mr. Forbes has got his power back on. So we're going to try and add him back in here. Hurricane got you, didn't it, Caleb? <laughs> Hurricane got me. <clears throat> power is uh, power still out actually. Uh, so I thought very quickly, and I was like, "Wait, there's a uh, the podcasting app that we use is like there's a there's an app for the iPhone. I can quickly get on and jump, just that's jump awesome. on the signal." 
<laughs> so at least you get office. to get back on here and help us wrap up the show. So were you? I saw you kind of waiting in the lobby for me. Were you able to hear some of those the questions that we did? Yeah, the last two. Okay. Uh, phenomenal. Okay, job. good. Yeah, good, good, good. Um, it really just went back. I thought to a lot of what we talked about before with need versus one, especially that last question. Um, the first one was a question about caster. He he put mm-hmm. a lift on. And it was a Terraflex 1.5 with some Falcon shocks. Good shocks, good lift. Mm-hmm. But in that kit, there's no caster correction. And his complaint was Correct. that he was, it was all over the road. So we talked a little bit about control arms. Uh, we talked about some of the, like the Terraflex sport arms, a little bit cheaper, more of an OE style, but longer. And then we talked about, you know, like the, uh, the metal cloak uh, service free and the, uh, the rock crawler adventure series. Uh, and then, when, you know, obviously when you get up into like Evo with the Johnny joint, rock crawler X factor, all that kind of stuff. A lot of different ways you can do that, but I just basically told him uh, that was a question from Jamie and the Jeep Wrangler JL group to um, yeah. put some arms on there. I did give honorable mention to Geo Brackets, but you know I'm not a Geo Bracket guy. Yeah, I just can't absolutely. I can't. I can't do it. I just can't do it. So, well, that's what I've got. Um, I did kind of finish up. You kind of jumped off right there in that last segment. We finished up the segment. Talked about the reasons. Really, the last was the reasons to enjoy what you have. Um, so I'm not going to go back over it because you were the only one not here. The listeners were here. They were here. <laughs> we were talking. You ducked out. So if you want to hear what I said, you're just going to have to go listen to the Dirt to Dust podcast wherever you may find podcasts, which for everybody out there, um, you know, telling your friends about it, make sure you're telling them. You can find us on YouTube. You can find us on Spotify. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, uh, YouTube Podcasts, all that good stuff. I think we are working on getting now on iHeart, iHeart Radio mm-hmm. Podcast. Just trying to get out there and get to more places um, to get to people, kind of get to people where they are, meet them where they're at. Yep. Um, even if Caleb has to do it from his iPhone app sometimes, or me <laughs> last week with the Spectrum outage. But, you know, it's the rescue run when you film a podcast in a tropical storm. Yes. Th- this is what happens, people. Um, but we got we got Caleb back at least for the closeout. So um, we do want to thank everybody as always. I did not get to do this last week, so I am going to do this this week. Thank everybody for tuning in, whether it's video, whether it's audio, whatever, however, whenever. Thank you guys for listening, tuning in, and or watching. Uh, do remember, if you are watching, uh, do remember to hit that like and subscribe button with that notification bell so you know when our episodes are coming out. We do try to get you guys an episode every week, generally on Friday. Um, <clears throat> uh, Apple Podcasts, make sure you're leaving us those five-star reviews. Bump us up the list there on Apple Podcast in the off-road uh, industry stuff because everybody and their brother has a podcast. Um, I guess we're part of everybody and their brother. Uh, But there's a lot, man. There's a lot out there. They say Somebody said that 95% of podcasts don't make it past like 20 episodes. Mm -hmm. There's a ton of freaking podcasts out there with five, six, seven episodes. I think this is episode – we're into our upper 30s. We're closing in on 40 now. 38. This is episode 38. Sweet. Yeah. All right. We'll do something. (laughs) We're going to dedicate this episode to my 38-inch Nitto Trail Grappler tires on my <laughs> Jeep Wrangler 4 by And then maybe we'll dedicate the next episode or two episodes from now to your 40s on your LJ. So you got two weeks. 42, to sir. 42. Oh, so you got a few extra weeks then. You got a few extra weeks before we do a dedication. Okay. Right. All right. That's why you went 42s. You need those two extra weeks. We'll Absolutely. find somebody else in two weeks to dedicate the 40th episode to. I'm thinking Candace in Nashville, Outlaw Off-Road yeah, Nashville. Yeah, 100%. She needs a dedication because that I'll, I'll be interested to know if that 392 is fixed up by then with the exhaust issues from Moab. But she said you know, they're going to bring it out the trail days. So, um, Speaking of trail days, we did go through. I think we found we have a couple of spots, right? We do have a few spots um, open. We went very through. Few. There yeah. is very few, but we went through and figured out kind of like, who had made a donation versus who had signed up, who had made a donation to just make a donation. And then there was a few that had made a donation, but they were sponsoring veterans, but they had both. So we got all that. We had our, our, our spreadsheet cleaned up. It, it released a couple of spots. Um, so there is that. Um, you are guys are able to still sign up for that. I think we are going to do a little bit of modification on the groups, probably, probably a little less on beginner, probably add an intermediate group. Um, mm-hmm. But those are still up on there. When we close those groups out on the sign-up page, you just, you'll just you see it. You'll know because you won't be able to sign up for that group. Um, so I would recommend doing that sooner rather than later. We are just over one month one month away. Uh, we did add Steer Smarts as a corporate sponsor to the uh, to the event over the last week. I uh, was dealing with uh, Andy and Jay up there. Great guys, great company, um, great American-made product. Even though they are technically in Michigan, 
but, <laughs> but the product is made in Ohio, so you can trust it. It's made just over the border. They're smart. They know. They may live in Michigan, but they know to make their product in Ohio. So O-H-I-O, go Buckeyes. Um, so that's what we'll do there. I think we're actually going to have – I was talking to Andy earlier this week. We we're going to have him on the show. Uh, he wants to get on talk talk steering. So we're going to get him on in the next uh, – we'll get him on before trail days. Um, we're going to get him on sometime in the month of August to get on here and talk about steer smarts and just and just steering in general. Um, you know, when why to upgrade, the different options of upgrading steel, aluminum, that crazy gyrating thing they've got for their drag link, which is super cool that a lot of people I don't think understand. They're super crazy, beefy, um, those aluminum sweet sway bar links they got. So uh, we're going to get into all that um, with Andy. That's going to be pretty cool. And then hopefully – we're going to be celebrating the return of Elon, the 4 by e here to North Carolina soon. It looks like next week, I think, she's coming back to Tennessee. Um, but it looks like I'm going to have to fly to Nashville, drive it to Windrock, and go straight to a trail. I think we're going to go hit some trails with Next Venture Motorsports right before uh, Great Smoky Mountain Jeep Invasion. I know there are some outlaws going to Jeep Invasion. I think um, check out the uh, Outlaw Off-Road Charlotte. Greensboro mm-hmm. may get in it, too. I mean, I know Charlotte's kind of running point on this. They are doing something for Great Smoky Mountain Jeep Invasion, just kind of driving around like a, hey, spot me type thing. Um, definitely check them out. They're Outlaw Off-Road Charlotte on Facebook, and they are also at Outlaw Off-Road Charlotte on Instagram. So check them out and follow them. I know there's been some posts about that. Um, and as of today, um, so depending on what time you're watching this, whether it's in the morning or afternoon, I want to say around um, 1.30 p.m. today, Friday, um, there will be a, uh, a pretty cool announcement video that is that will explain what's going on. There are some incredible uh, vendors that have stepped in and donated some product uh, to give away. And it's going to be, as you'll see, it's the biggest giveaway Outlaw Fruit has ever done. That's pretty sweet. It is pretty sweet. So. It's got me actually thinking about going to Jeep Invasion. My original intent was not to go because of Crandon. Um, mm-hmm. But then I found out that Crandon... Ultra Four is a mess right now. <laughs> it's just an absolute <laughs> mess. Um, it it is just, man. I, I don't want to hate on Ultra Four, but it's a mess. It's an absolute mess right now. So, I'm still not a hundred percent sure that Crandon's actually even happening for all Ultra Four classes. But mm-hmm. I do know that if it does, it's not a points race. Yeah, uh, we got a lot of points there last year on both races, um, but no points this year. It's kind of a mm-hmm. international thing. So there's no points for the East, no points for the uh, for the National. It's a different thing altogether. So knowing that, and I know even even Lauren Healy was like, you know, I'll go to Crandon if there's some competition there. Um, you know, and I was the same way. If I can go race against Lauren and Bailey again, I'm going. Yeah. And Lauren was like, yeah, well, because you know, I'm pretty sure he'll go and bring the 4400 car. But and a lot of drivers stepped up and said, we're just not going. They don't like. Yeah. You know, 4600 generally is a slower class than 45 and 48. There are a few mm-hmm. of us that can run with those guys, but those cars are few and far between. There's only four, probably three or four of us that can do it. Mm-hmm. Um, just from a technology and horsepower standpoint and and financial backing and all that kind of stuff. But generally speaking, the 4,600 cars, you know, some of those guys were getting absolutely run the heck over by the fast 45s and 48s. We were out there lapping. We were lapping cars. Yeah. Um, you know, so I could definitely see the argument. They just don't want to do it. Like, they just don't want to put it at risk. When there's no points, no money, basically on the line, and so I get it, I totally get it. So we've pretty much made the decision to drop Crandon, but it looks like we're going to pick up an endurance race in Texas in December. Okay. The same race that we talked about last week that Sergio had taken forty six fifty five to. Update: They did finish. Uh, they got fourth, uh, so they were just short of a podium, but they did finish. They had a they were they had a ton of issues, um, mechanical stuff. Computer was actually okay. I think they just had a couple of little new new build bugs, um, mm-hmm. but they were still able to get that thing across the line. Uh, they finished their six hour race. I think they got nine laps in of a ten and a half, eleven mile lap. So real good for them. They you know good on them for getting it done. Uh, even you know kind of adapting and overcoming through a ton of adversity. But they did get that race done. So that series is now goes has another race in December. So it looks like uh, looks like we'll be taking forty six ninety nine to that and trying to win that. I think they call that the full size B group, um, which mm-hmm. is basically basically anything you want up to thirty seven. And they they put a limit on tire size. So I'm yeah. uh, looking forward to doing that. It's uh in I think it's Gatesville, Texas. It's basically right between da- uh, Dallas and Dallas and Houston. I think 
Um, so looking forward to that little six hour endurance race down there. Not a lot of rocks, but a lot of go fast, a lot of dirt. Um, yeah, maybe we'll get some airborne. I don't know. We'll see how that goes. But and then of course we're still looking at still still planning on doing nationals in Oklahoma, just for the race. We'll see what Ultra Four does uh, from a marketing standpoint. And then of course we've got signups coming up pretty soon for Koh. We plan on doing the Desert Challenge, uh, the Toyo Desert Challenge, uh, out there at Hammertown. Uh, I guess for us would be late January. So. We're not going to have much of a downtime this year. If we go to nationals and then we race mm-hmm. in December and then we turn around six weeks later and we're at Hammers doing doing the Desert Challenge, I think we're already looking. We're already making plans for the Mint, which is like six weeks after that. So it is – here we are, August, August of 2024, already hot and heavy planning the race season uh, for next year, but I wouldn't have it any other way. So um, I think that's all we got. We'll probably talk a little bit more about trail days um we might have some news on jeep tastic coming in the next couple weeks so yeah. that's kind of where we are now i think we've even got some news coming out on a new t-shirt coming pretty soon we'll have some designs up on that before long so man never miss an episode people you never know <laughs> what you never know what we're going to talk about you never know what we're going to announce you never know uh what we're going to release you just don't know so uh final thing i'll say before kind of signing off is big nod out to nitto uh we were right it was the terra grappler g3 cool times Yep, it is. Uh, not a lot of not a lot of uh, big kid sizes yet, um, but it is coming. It is coming. So looking forward yeah. to seeing those in the coming months. Uh, but yeah, the new Terra Grappler G3. I'm liking the tread pattern. Uh, it looks like a good tire. It looks like a solid upgrade from the G2. So good on Nitto there. Wanted to reach out to them and and say that I I definitely like where they're headed with the G3. And it's not so far that it competes with the Recon Grappler. So I think they did a yeah. All, all looks, it looks like um, they did a pretty good job on it. It looks like you're going to be able to get your hands on those coming up in early to mid-September in the sizes they release. Of course, you can go to nittotire.com and see the, the sizes that are coming out. It's not a huge rele- not a huge size catalog yet, uh, but they are coming, and it kind of gives you an idea of when they're coming if you go to nittotire.com and look at the all-new Terra Grappler G3, and it is, it is truly all-new. It is completely different, so... Um, shout out to those guys for getting that done. Uh, so yeah, Caleb, that's where we're going to wrap it up before one of us loses power again. Um, <laughs> hopefully by the time everybody's watching this, the storm has passed through everybody's safe and good and, and, uh, and happy and, and warm again, uh, in the North Carolina summer. Um, so yeah, that's where we'll leave it. Thank you guys for stopping in, listening, watching wherever you are, however you may be watching us, whatever you may be doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That is where we will leave it. Until we see you again here on Dirt to Dust, presented by Outlaw Off-Road. Peace out, everyone. See you next week. You've been listening to Dirt to Dust, presented by Outlaw Off-Road. The premier off-road centers for Jeeps, trucks, and SUVs. Sounds a little bit arrogant, doesn't it? Oh, well. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. Be sure to tell your friends about the show, too. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, to see more and to see what Outlaw Off-Road offers, hit the website at theoutlawoffroad.com. See you next time. Don't follow us. You're not going to make it.